What makes someone a hero? Superhuman powers? A flashy outfit? The thing is, not all heroes wear capes. Some wear lab coats, some wear suits, some wear scuba gear. Science produces a lot of heroes. National Science Week is a chance to honour those heroes and inspire new ones by getting involved in one of hundreds of online science events. Just Google National Science Week. No cape required. Yuma, hello in the language of the Ngunnawal people here in the nation's capital. I'm Misha Schubert, the CEO of Science and Technology Australia, and together with Questacon, the nation's science and technology centre, we're delighted to co-host this virtual launch of National Science Week 2020. Let's begin properly by grounding ourselves in place and time. We broadcast today from the traditional lands of the Ngunnawal and Ngambri peoples of Canberra. And we pay our respects to elders and ancestors, knowledge makers who have deep connections and knowledge of this place in our country. For this place has been a meeting place for Indigenous leaders in science, technology, engineering and maths for thousands and thousands of years. Today we're going to give you a very special preview of some of the highlights of National Science Week that will take place across the country over the next seven days. And then we will take you behind the scenes of Australia's COVID response to show you how science, maths, technology and engineering have played a crucial role in the huge effort to keep Australians safe and to save lives through this extraordinary set of circumstances this year. But first, a warm welcome from the Director of Questacon, Professor Graeme Durant. Yuma, and welcome to the Schmidt Studio here at Questacon in Canberra. I'm Graham Durant and I have the pleasure of being director of Questacon and we're proud to be able to host this launch of National Science Week 2020 in partnership with Science and Technology Australia. So welcome to National Science Week 2020 and what a year to be celebrating science, to be focusing on the wonder and delight and building our curiosity and imagination because science has never before been so important to society. We're delighted that the festival this year has attracted over a thousand events and you can check these out at the scienceweek.net.au website. And for the first time Australians around the world will be able to join in with this new online format. So before we start we should acknowledge not only the Ngunnawal on the land at which we meet, but also our partners across Australia, the voluntary committees that have come together to make the events possible, the inspiring Australian managers, and importantly, ABC Science, the Australian Science Teachers Association, and CSIRO, who've been partners from the outset when the Science Festival first started many years ago. So this is the 23rd National Science Week, and it's going from strength to strength, even in these post-COVID times. So what a challenging time, 2020. What a time to stand up for science, even though some of you may be sitting down as you join online. What a time to find the wonder and delight in science. And what a time to fuel your curiosity and imagination. We hope that you will do this during National Science Week 2020. And we need to finish with a big virtual hug for all of you locked down in Victoria, and those across Australia that have been struggling with the fires, the smoke, the floods, and now the COVID crisis, you're in our thoughts. It's a time not only to stand up for science, but it's a time to trust the science and trust the scientists. Yara. Thank you, Graeme, for that generous welcome and for co-hosting this event with us today. In just a few moments, Science Minister Karen Andrews will officially launch National Science Week. But before she does, we wanted to give you a taste of some of the exciting events and content that will take place across the nation over the next seven days. Hello, welcome to National Science Week 2020. Online, but definitely no less fun, featuring everything from sourdough to the science of swing dancing. We hope you'll join us on Thursday, August the 20th for our event, Beauty from the Ashes an intriguing mixture of artistic and scientific perspectives on fire affected landscapes in Tasmania. We hope to see you there. Science Week in Queensland. 
So Orion is a very famous constellation. He's the hunter. And so we're going to look towards his sword and you're gonna see a number. So I want you to click on that and you're going to see the Orion Nebula. Now, this is the place where stars are born. That's what nebulas are. They're stellar nurseries and they're just these vast, vast clouds of gas and dust. And those bright points that you see, those are hot young stars. And each one of those took about a million years to form. We can't wait for you to join us during National Science Week in Western Australia. We can't wait for you to join us during National Science Week in New South Wales. See you soon. Yes, <laughs>
or looking at a treatment or looking at vaccines. So this is an opportunity for us to recognise and thank our scientists right across Australia. So I encourage you to go out and have a look at what science can offer you, whether it be in uh, medical research or whether it be in other areas, environmental sciences, agricultural sciences, some real opportunities are out there and I encourage you during National Science Week to take advantage of every single opportunity that comes your way to have a good look at science and what it means to us here in Australia. Thank you, Minister Karen Andrews, for officially launching National Science Week 2020. For those of you just tuning in to the broadcast now and joining us, Yuma, hello in the Ngunnawal language. I'm Misha Schubert, the CEO of Science and Technology Australia, and we are co-hosting, along with Questacon, the nation's science and technology centre, this year's virtual launch of National Science Week. Amidst the tumultuous events of 2020, science has been front and centre. Science, technology, engineering and maths have been crucial to calibrate some of the safety strategies that we've pursued as a country uh, and to guide some of our thinking and expertise uh, to try and save lives and keep people safe. So today, as part of this launch, we're going to take you behind the scenes of Australia's COVID success and show you how maths, science, technology and engineering have played a crucial role in keeping Australians safe and saving lives. So welcome to Science Saving Lives, the stories behind Australia's COVID success. So welcome to Science Saving Lives, the story behind Australia's COVID success. Joining us today, uh, Professor Alan Cheng, who's played a key role as a technical advisor to the AHPPC and who's also got substantive roles with Monash University in Melbourne and at the Alfred Health. Uh, Professor James McCaw, who's a mathematical modeler from the University of Melbourne and the Doherty Institute in Melbourne, who's, which has also had a crucial role throughout this extraordinary experience. Dr. Kudzai Kanutu, who's a leading infectious diseases doctor at the Royal Melbourne Hospital in Melbourne, and who's also played a role in assisting aged care homes with testing throughout the Victorian experience of the last few months. Dr. Deb Eagles, the Deputy Director of the Australian Centre for Disease Preparedness at the CSIRO in Geelong, and Professor Paul Young of the University of Queensland, who along with his team of brilliant young scientists has been leading the research effort on one of the leading candidates for a vaccine for COVID-19. So to begin, let's cast our minds back to January and February of 2020 and reports that were starting to trickle in and around the world about something that was happening in China. Professor Alan Cheng, can I start with you? Take us back to those months and the reports that were starting to filter in here to Australia and how people in the infectious diseases and epidemiological community were looking at that information with the benefit of that strong scientific skill set and starting to think about what the implications might be and what we might be seeing and particularly how that set of thoughts and conversations might have led you to a telephone call one day with a chap called Brendan Murphy. <laughs> Yeah, so we in infectious diseases we have a, a mailing list that um, uh, the media reports of new viruses and new things uh, that are happening um, around the world um, are um, are published. And uh, towards the end of December, actually, there were there were a couple of reports, and it was what's called in the in the term a RFI, a request for information about um, these uh, case clusters that were happening um, in uh, China of, of pneumonia. And then I think it was about the um, the sixth or seventh of uh, January. There was um, uh, some reports to say that uh, they'd identified as a new coronavirus, and we sort of immediately knew that this was pretty significant because um, we'd had MERS coronavirus and SARS coronavirus in the past. So um, that sort of put our uh, antenna up. But obviously, MERS coronavirus isn't um, anything like uh, this coronavirus. So um, we really didn't know exactly so how serious it was going to be. So, but as sort of the weeks went on, it was starting to look more more important. There was more reports coming out of um, uh, China and uh, uh, reports that, uh, uh, that, you know, they were going to lock down, um, you know, parts of China and, uh, and that obviously meant that um, they were taking it very seriously. 
So um, my background is um, in influenza and obviously pandemics are a big uh, feature of influenza. So, uh, and um, uh, run one of the surveillance systems uh, for uh, influenza in Australia, looking at um, hospitalizations. Um, so um, uh, I got a call from um, Brendan Murphy saying, um, you know, something's going on. Um, you know, what do you think um, about what we should do? And um, I think there were a couple of conversations and then he said, would you mind coming on to AHPPC to um, uh, give a hand with um, give, giving expert medical advice and epidemiological advice to um, the country? So that obviously was a pretty big um, moment for my career, but, uh, you know, it's a really important um, feature to have um, people that understand um, uh, epidemiological uh, data and can synthesize all of this to um, to help um, and and I, I think you know with the public health response you know, the, the public health physicians are so um, busy with um, responding to what's happening it's often helpful to have someone that ha actually has just a little bit more time um, uh, to actually go and be able to read and synthesize all this evidence and put it all together for them. And Professor James McCaw, that's a lovely segue into your role in this uh, set of events as well, because around that same time, you were also one of the other technical experts who was seconded into that group. And you've got a really interesting background in physics and mathematical modelling uh, and in public health responses as well. Tell us a bit about how that skill set came to be crafted and its application to the sort of things that we were seeing in those early phases about the preparatory work, including some modelling you might have done late one night. Yeah, so um, my first formal involvement uh, with COVID-19 was on, I think, the 16th of January when the World Health Organization called to group, um, uh, an informal meeting of mathematical modelers and infectious disease um, epidemiologists uh, to hear some evidence that it looked like the, the virus was more widespread in China than um, the case reports at the time based on um, how many cases had turned up overseas over um, the last, you know, the early part of January. And it, it took a, another week or so through to mid-January to, to first uncover that there were more cases. Once the authorities started doing more testing, they rapidly found um, more cases. And it took, during that week, it became more and more clear that this was a transmissible virus between human, directly from human to human and um, that's really what set the alarm bells off. Uh, like Alan, uh, I suddenly found myself with a, I didn't get a personal phone call, but I got an email saying, can you please uh, present to the um, AHPPC um, on the current modeling based analysis um, of that pandemic? And it was in late January. And uh, we then with my close colleague, Professor Jody McVernon, um, we were on WHO teleconferences every few days for, for a couple mm -hmm. of weeks. And one night we heard um, an analysis of travel patterns that suggested that Melbourne and Sydney were two of the most likely places for people from Wuhan to arrive by plane. Uh, we computed some you know, risks, you know, very simple calculations of the chance that the virus might get here. Um, uh, wrote to Brendan Murphy that night about 2 a.m. I think Jody wrote the email. And it was, more, it was within 48 hours uh, that the borders were closed with China and that really set the stage for now six months or so of um, very regular meetings and um, mathematics based interpretations of what's going on to try and help support that uh, public health response. And, and those actions that were taken then as a consequence of understanding, uh, you know, what the cost of inaction might be, uh, mm -hmm. were starting to then buy some time in a really practical sense for our hospital system to scale up. And Dr. Kuzai Kanutu, can I bring you in here to perhaps talk to that piece, that those valuable precious weeks of time that were bought whilst we were looking around the world to understand what was happening in other countries that uh, had experienced that first wave earlier than Australia, what was happening in Australia's hospital system during that time and what were you thinking and, and witnessing from colleagues overseas? Um, yeah, so uh, January was a, a really big month. And I think James reflects on the fact that, you know, the first few weeks of January were just fact finding and certainly from the hospital sector. So we had our first case in Melbourne end of January. So that Australia Day long weekend was the time when we were actually getting to the point of being able to culture um, the virus. So. For our, my hospital in particular, it was quite personal. It got real very quickly because we actually had a patient who was found, firstly, was from the right place, so was traveling from China, 
via Wuhan. So it was a very first-hand experience. And I think from then on, um, locally, it was a little bit of a, a, a disconnect in the sense that we're starting to hear that uh, certainly colleagues in Italy and, and particularly in Europe and obviously in China are starting to report some really challenging um, scenarios in terms of people presenting very unwell. Um, but at that time, we're not there yet. Um, so, yeah, we absolutely did have time to live vicariously by seeing what was unravelling and unfolding elsewhere, but also having a little bit of breathing space to start thinking through and starting to leverage some of the work that Jody and James and others were doing to try and predict, well, if this happened at this scale here, what could we actually feasibly do? How quickly would it take before we were completely overrun? Do we have enough ventilators? Do we have enough PPE? Um, because those were the things that really hit hard in all of the hospital settings where they didn't have enough time is that they ran out of PPE. So they're running ICU wards, makeshift hospitals with no equipment, no staff, and just really struggling. So we were lucky to have that little bit of space, um, but it really did feel a little bit seat of your pants because it was all just predicting what might happen in our context. And similarly, uh, exactly through that same period as well, whilst you were on the front lines in that medical context, could I, Professor Paul Young, you were uh, looking at the product of years and years of work and the brilliant young scientists in the, in the lab that you lead uh, and looking at applications potentially for something that you had worked on for a long, long time. We know that science is something that often requires a lot of patience and a lot of long-term investment. And then there can be moments of great elation Talk us through the end of January and the first couple of weeks of February for you and what you and your team were hoping and trying to do. Well, if you bear with me just briefly, I might take you back 40 years um, <laughs> because I, I've been working in this space for, for a little over 40 years now when I was a young uh, scientist. And what struck me as uh, something that I wanted to contribute to were what was uh, research into diseases that were in those days called neglected diseases, or in particularly neglected tropical diseases. And my, my particular interest was dengue. And uh, the expertise we were bringing to that was underlying expertise in, in generating vaccines. And so I had been in this game for quite some time. I did my PhD at the London School of Hygiene and Tropical Medicine. So again, reinforcing that that interest in a um, in a tropical diseases that don't normally get a lot of uh, attention, particularly from big pharma. And so we had WHO support to take us down that path. So I, my lab comes from a very strong background in in understanding and building, uh, you know, the basic science behind what goes into uh, a product like a vaccine getting out there into the market. So some 10 years ago, uh, one of the postdocs in my lab came up with an idea uh, to make a better vaccine for a wide range of different viruses. And we call that a platform technology. So it's a platform for applying to a wide range of areas. We didn't get any funding for that for the first five or six years. Um, we were, we were uh, doing the research on the smell of an oily rag and uh, it, we only got funding um, from the National Health and Medical Research Council in 2017 to really ramp up that project. And so what we did was build this underlying pipeline of activities that could lead us from basic science to, through to a vaccine and, uh, and apply it to maybe unknown uh, disease uh, pathogens. And that's where an organisation like uh, called CEPI or Coalition for Epidemic Preparedness Innovation comes comes in. Very long, uh, long name, but let's stick with uh, CEPI. Uh, they are essentially the funding arm of uh, of an idea that WHO had back in 2016, um, that really um, came to the conclusion that we as a globe. We as, a, we as a population need to be better prepared uh, for the next emerging outbreak, at least it was perceived at the time. And they actually came up with a list of exotic viruses that might actually emerge. Uh, and their last one, the eighth on the list, was something that they called Disease X. And that was the first time this concept had actually been brought forward, that maybe we could start building preparedness for an unknown. And so we got funding, uh, three years of funding that began in 2019 with the whole idea of building this pipeline of activities specifically focused here in Australia. So we had partners in Melbourne at the Doherty Institute, CSIRO and at the Australian National University uh, to build this um, pipeline of activities that we could plug together to lead from an unknown to a vaccine in a very short period of time. Um, so for us, 
um, when we heard first heard about uh, the emerging outbreak in China, it was the end of uh, 2019 in December. We kept our eye on it, uh, and amazing what Twitter does for you, but Twitter was where we heard uh, the first indications, and, uh, and, and it started to ramp up in, in those early weeks of January. And what we decided as a group, um, regardless of what, uh, what the um, subsequent emergency might be, and none of us predicted a pandemic of this scale. I can say that quite confidently. Um, not of a coronavirus anyway. I mean, the next pandemic of this scale people thought might be a flu. Uh, an influenza virus. But we didn't really predict uh, another virus spreading to this scale. Nonetheless, we had this pipeline of activities and we thought, well, when the sequence comes out, we'll, we'll grab that sequence and apply it and just see how well we can do. Uh, and we got a, um, an email from our SEPI minders uh, on January the 10th saying, just giving us a little bit of warning because they'd heard some uh, some noise from WHO that this may actually be spreading a little bit faster than anyone had anticipated. Uh, it just so happened that January 11th, uh, the uh, um, chi uh, Chinese plus an Australian collaborator, Eddie Holmes, uh, announced the sequence of this virus. And so within 24 hours, uh, the folks in the lab had designed our first constructs of a vaccine. So our vaccine doesn't actually need the live virus. We can just go straight from sequence information. And so we designed our first constructs by uh, January uh, 12, and uh, by January the 21st, we were well underway in, in, in analysing that. But we got another email from us, uh, our CEPI uh, minders saying, well, actually, we want to trigger this. Uh, we would like to fund you to take uh, development of a vaccine all the way through uh, clinical trials into deployment, should it be successful. And they gave the University of Queensland 48 hours to make the decision as to whether we'd sign up to that. Um, so I can tell you, it was a frantic 20, uh, 48 hours. Our, our VC came in on a Saturday morning. I've got the shot of him in his shorts and his T-shirt uh, sitting at the uh, uh, university um, uh, major executive conference table signing off on the contract deal. And uh, thus began the, uh, you know, the now six months into uh, uh, the development of a vaccine with a number of very important partners. Um, through an, a number of critical stages so that we actually have that vaccine in clinical trials right right as we speak. So a number of, uh, a number of individuals have had that vaccine uh, injected into their arms and we're going to be monitoring their responses and we'll get our first feedback in October. I'm really pleased you've mentioned preparedness uh, because yeah. that's a lovely note on which to bring in Dr. Debbie Eagles, who's of course the Deputy Director of the Australian Centre for uh, Disease Preparedness at the CSIRO's facility in Geelong. And one of the things that strikes me, has struck me repeatedly throughout this experience, has been watching this collaboration between this network of institutions that have been built over decades and decades worth of investment and capability building. Debbie, talk us through the role that your centre plays players in this part of the puzzle and that work of trying to understand how this virus actually works, how it might change over time, but also um, what some of the preparedness activities need to be around preparing for that moment when, if and when we get a vaccine path to uh, test it to, to success and then to uh, deploy into a manufacturing setting in Australia. Yeah, thanks, Misha, and um, really happy to follow Paul because, uh, firstly, uh, our sort of background and, and work towards this has been very similar to what Paul's described. And he's also uh, uh, spelt out CEPI, which means I don't need to spell out CEPI again because uh, I'm sure I'll get it uh, get it wrong if I try to. So, um, it, look, very similar sort of background and path to where we are here to what Paul described for um, his U University of Queensland team. So at ACDP, it's been a very long path around um, uh, sort of preparedness, mitigation and uh, response for disease agents, infectious disease agents. And really that started for us around um, animal health disease agents uh, 35 years ago when the centre was first built. But moving towards um, what we call zoonotic disease agents, so those that infect um, both people and animals. So um, some of those have been mentioned by others here already around uh, influenza, obviously the broader coronavirus group, things like Hendra and Nipper. And it's really um, been very much around developing the capabilities for 
all aspects of preparedness for those diseases and ability to respond. So development of diagnostic assays, development of preclinical models for vaccine testing, um, a range of different skill sets and capabilities that can really only be built over time. And um, you, you've uh, noted, Misha, the, the importance of collaboration. And I think that's been absolutely vital in terms of our ability to respond uh, quickly. Um, and Paul's noted that as well, obviously, and others have both talked about engagement with WHO and so on. That, that um, preparedness piece and those existing collaborations has been absolutely essential for us to be able to um, sort of jump onto this quickly, build on those existing collaborations and share with each other. And a really important example of that is um, around the first isolation of the virus in Australia from the Doherty Institute. There's no way that we could have done any of the work that we're doing now around preclinical models for vaccine testing um, and then ultimately some of the virus survivability work, um, genomic work and so on. None of that could be happening without that um, interaction and support from the Doherty and their willingness to share that virus with us and, and with others internationally. And that's just one example and that's happening um, on a range of different fronts. Um, both nationally and then at an international level through existing um, and developing collaborations. So for us, that's led to, as I mentioned, um, evaluation of um, a number of vaccines, again, supported by CEPI, as, as Paul's indicated, um, and equally looking at um, spot survival time. So really wanting to understand uh, uh, how the virus survives in different temperatures and humidities, for example, and that can then feed into um, policy to uh, modelling and so on. So we better understand disease uh, transmission and, and the risks associated in different settings. So um, as all the others have indicated, that sort of long standing development of capability, that preparedness piece is absolutely important and those existing collaborations are vital. Mm -hmm. And I, in terms um, of some, let's yeah. go on. I was just going to ask, um, just picking up on that openness and transparency, um, it's been such a defining factor of this um, sort of from the where I sit and see it as well, and I think it's just worth saying a bit about. So among our epidemiological community, we've, we've continued those WHO meetings sharing uh, scientific findings prior to preprint. So even before they're released to public, we're often meeting as groups up to 100 people now sharing results actually using video conferences as an informal peer review mechanism and then the work's coming out on websites it's being shared publicly codes available and this is an amazing endorsement of this open science movement in my view um, it's enabled us to share knowledge rapidly around the world um, our group in australia has helped the canadian government with some modeling um, we've learned a huge amount um, as alan well knows in Australia based on other groups' um, epidemiological analyses. And that openness um, is, is, has been so important to, to the response to date. It's a terrific it's, point. It, Paul, jump in. Yeah, I, I, can I just support that? I, I, quite frankly, it's, it's unprecedented. Um, yeah. The level of collaboration right across the globe uh, from, I mean, we as vaccine developers, um, I, I think we probably would be um, collaborating even more with the practicalities of um, our different approaches if it wasn't for the fact that we're all moving so fast. I don't think uh, we've really had the, the, the uh, chance to um, collaborate in the context of joining uh, forces. But what we're doing is sharing information, sharing um, you know reagents and so on that each of us could use. Uh, there are countless numbers of um, night, nightly teleconferences around the world. Australia always gets the short shrift with that. <laughs> and we always think <laughs> in the wee hours of the morning talking to our American and uh, and European colleagues. Uh, but, you know, even even down to the journals uh, where a lot of this work is being published, we now have you know, people placing their data straight up online so that people can access it before it's been peer reviewed. And when it's been peer reviewed, it goes into journals and most of the major journals are not putting them behind paywalls. So in other words, you don't have to have a subscription to these to see that data. It, it really is an unprecedented global uh, interaction and it's just been wonderful to see and I just hope, maybe beyond hope, but I just hope that we actually progress and, and stay on this path um, post this pandemic and we start dealing with science in this way in the future, at least in, in uh, partially in this, uh, this sort of collaborative way because it's been incredibly fruitful. Let's hope I we think it's all good so muscle memory. <laughs> Go on, Deb. I think it's also avoided a lot of duplication. So in the sharing that we've done, there's been um, across networks, uh, 
uh, a case of uh, different countries and different uh, labs saying, well, we'll do this bit if you can do that bit. Um, uh, this is what we're looking at. So not just a sharing methods of, but a recognition that we're all incredibly busy and all doing this under really challenging circumstances in terms of our workforce and how we manage them in relation to the, the COVID risk. So everyone's really um, identifying where they can play their piece and share that information so that we're not duplicating um, you know, efforts exactly. And, and really I think just to, just to reinforce that, it's about capacity as well. Um, mm -hmm. You know, there might be a perception out there that all of us can do all of these things. But in fact, some of the high level engagement, such as the, the work um, in CSIRO with their, their animal facilities, there are a limited number of capacities around the world that have that. Um, um, ability to, to, to work with high containment uh, animals and uh, and that means that if you don't have that sharing and, and, and the complementary approach there will be a lot of duplication so that that's true in a lot of different areas. I'm interested in I think, I perhaps unpacking with each of, go on Alan. <laughs> Oh, sorry. I was just going to say. I think one of the things we're seeing is is science being done in real time, and I'm sure, you know, um, everyone else um, has seen this. That you know, these are the sort of things that would probably happen over you know years and years, and you know, there'd be a publication, and someone would write a letter or write to you and say, "What do you think about this?" But now, you know, because of the urgency, um, and um, and I guess because of modern technology as well, that um, everything is happening so much quicker. It's you know the self-correcting record. Um, really Really, uh, being played out in front of our eyes and that's that's really breathtaking really. I'm really interested to hear a little bit from each of you as well about some of the expressed parts of your STEM skill sets and how you've acquired them along the way but also how they're being applied in the context of the work each of you are doing and maybe Alan if we start with you you did some maths at high school and then went off into a, a medical degree but you've come back to statistics later in your career. What yeah, has no, this knowledge of stats given you and how's that enhanced your straight medical training in a sense to be ready to play your role in this historic moment. Yeah, so I'm sure James would still laugh at my math skills, but uh, I mean, I think you know, I, when I did high school mathematics, you know, I did, um, you know, it wasn't too difficult, but I thought a lot of it was pretty esoteric. So, you know, matrix algebra was sort of, you know, curious and fun to do, but like I never really saw what the point of it all was. And then, so, and then, you know, I became a doctor and you really don't need matrix algebra, but um, uh, then I came back to um, uh, statistics and, and modeling and, um, and statistics is really sort of the basis actually for a lot of medicine um, and evidence and epidemiology, which is sort of what I do. And actually it is really important. And uh, I sort of came back to it and thought, oh, this is, you know, I sort of remember this from about 20 years ago, I better sort of brush, it, brush up on it again. And, um, uh, and, uh, so I sort of had to relearn it. And I think it really shows that, you know, a lot of the things that you learn, um, even, you know, in high school, uh, actually are sometimes quite useful and, and nothing's ever wasted. So, you know, you come back to a lot of things and um, and knowing, having an understanding of at least that concept exists and then you might need to go and actually learn it is, I think, a really important thing to take away. Mm. And James, you're a physicist by training and a PhD in physics, no less. And I think when a lot of lay people think about physics, they think about, you know, the study of matter and, and, and motion, time and space, rather than an epidemiological or medical application for that skill set. Just talk us through why that's actually a really terrific skill set to apply to what you do. And, and, and you're not the only person who's followed that path, are you? Yeah, um, so, I mean, I grew up um, fascinated by the esoteric, to, to, to use Alan's words. Um, as a high school student, um, um, I was interested in, in, in mathematics and, and, and physics, and obviously I kept on going with physics all the way through my um, undergraduate and then graduate studies. What it taught me was um, how to think about systems which evolve through time. Um, it taught me, I didn't realise at the time that a physics education taught me this, but it taught me to look at observations and then not just try and describe the patterns, but describe or understand why they'd be occurring and to do that precisely. And, and I see mathematics as nothing more and nothing less than a precise language with which to describe systems. Um, physics deals with simple systems, and so it gets very complicated maths trying to give very precise answers to something. It never occurred to me until my postdoc. Um, uh, which was in epidemiology, uh, it never occurred to me um, until until that time that we would be able to use mathematical principles to describe such 
wildly complicated systems as um, societies and diseases spreading through, um, spreading from social being to social being, that is human to human. Um, however, you can deconstruct the problem and you can get to the essence of why a disease spreads. Uh, I found this absolutely fascinating. Um, in fact, um, Alan may not remember, but in my very first few weeks as a postdoc uh, in the group, Alan was one of the people who turned up to our group meetings. I think he might have been rediscovering um, his interest in maths and, and statistics for, from his infectious disease and clinical perspective. And at the same time, I was um, understanding what epidemiology was and what diseases were. Um, and all of that comes together. Um, I'm just one small part in that um, multidisciplinary mix that you need in a pandemic. Um, of course, my training in physics doesn't mean I'm still a physicist. I've had 15 years working as an epidemiologist, and that's that relationship with government, with public health, that is a skill set I developed on the job uh, that lets me do the take on the role that I that I have. Um, yeah, but I'm still fascinated by the esoteric. I still have the physics magazines on the on the coffee table. <laughs> Uh, it's terrific uh, exhortation to become cross-skilled in, in, in all the disciplines as well. I love it. Um, could say you've got a training that's also really interesting uh, to me as well. You've, you've come through a, a medical pathway, but you've also had this long, passionate uh, interest in technology and its application in the medical context, haven't you? Tell us a bit more about that and, and particularly whether there have been applications out of that cross-mix of skills in this experience of the last few months. Yeah, absolutely. I think what all boils down to is that I'm just really nosy. If I can be in things or, or know what other people are doing, I'm all over it. And I think you'll all reflect, particularly for people who work in the infectious diseases community, they're all really great. They love to communicate. We love to share. And that's one of the beauties of working in this particular field. Um, so for me, that interest in technology really arose from that telescoping forward and thinking through what it could mean when the technology collides with the things that we already know and love. And it's actually that intermingling and the sort of chance encounters between things that seem to be not related and how that translates to, you know, to, to medical care and what's happening in the pandemic. And a lot of the challenges we've had around modelling is that, you, can, you know, you take a model, but then there are so many unknown factors that you're constantly having to sort of revise and try and then bring back into that model. And that's where that sort of esoteric background comes in really beautifully because it allows you to think out of the box and think, what is it that we've missed? Why are our numbers not coming down when we expected they would? Who do we need to get in here who maybe is thinking slightly differently about this problem that will allow us to solve that next challenge that is just around the corner? Um, so for me, that interest in technology is very much the same. Often when new technologies come on board, it's not 100% clear how they can be applied, um, but it's only over time and that sort of repeated iterative cycle of reflection and sharing information that you actually can see what's possible with everything that's on the table. So mix of curiosity and just wanting to see how you can apply different tools into new contexts to yield a, a different answer. That, that's Absolutely. one of the best answers to that question I have ever heard. <laughs> <laughs> Indeed. So Paul, let's hear your variation on that theme. Tell us about, talk to us of structural biology and protein chemistry and, and how all the bits of your skill set, what they are and how they have been directly applied in the, in the hunt for a vaccine. Yeah, that, that's perhaps getting a bit specific. I mean, I, I was going to start, as, as, as I was listening to the others, start with uh, the unending frustration of my parents that I used to take things apart to work out how they uh, how they ticked. I mean, uh, that was my introduction to the sort of technical component of, uh, of uh, science. And I, I got a chemistry set when I was 12, and I think it was history from then. Uh, but I also have a, my eldest daughter has um, became a theatre producer and now is a freelance writer. And we often have the conversation that we are very alike and, and we are very alike because we're both creative thinkers. And, and it's, about, it's about that creative component, I think, building on, on that last beautiful answer. I, I, it, it's, you know, pulling things from, from all different directions to, to come up with answers to a very complicated issue. Um, we can only do that because of that. Um, deep training that we have in problem solving, working as teams, and that's what makes um, makes scientists scientists, right? So, I, I mean, in my specific case, yes, it's um, a lot of years of doing structural biology, understanding how viruses are made, 
uh, so that we can identify which bits of them we need to focus on to develop vaccines for, using genetic engineering to express those proteins and how best to do that. We wouldn't be in the position we're in now if technology hadn't moved with a lot of those good ideas and we're now able to make um, recombinantly synthesize these proteins at very high levels and uh, so we can move it out of the laboratory and into a uh, into a large-scale manufacture this vaccine will be pointless if we couldn't manufacture it at scale and so that's the that's the step we're going through now working with our partners at CSL to actually uh, deliver on on the early early good um, early good results so it's a combination of things but I'd go back right to the to the core of you know uh, the problem solving abilities the uh, ability to work as a team the ability to um, collate information and, and to to describe that as a uh, as a cohesive story so others can uh, buy into your story and build on it um, communication in science is probably the most important component of all of that when you add it all together unless you can bring in uh, colleagues and and partners along with you on, on your uh, journey then it's going to be impossible to actually build on the, the collaborative whole so uh, so it's about it's about those skills I think that are most important rather than the the detailed understanding that I've built over years of just looking at the nitty-gritty I love that answer because it conveys the genuine sense of excitement that I feel whenever I hear you talk about what you're doing. Debbie Eagles, is there a similar story for you about that mix perhaps of, of childhood curiosity, but also what your training in veterinary science originally kind of brought to your skill set professionally that you still apply day to day in your work? Yeah, so look, um, certainly that cross-disciplinary sort of aspect that everyone else has spoken about is um, really relevant for me as well. And um, yeah, certainly uh, training in veterinary science, I mean, I'm one of those, was one of those kids that wondered why there was such a thing as a guidance officer, as they were called in the day, to uh, help you work out what subjects you should do to be, you know, determine what job because uh, that you, you'd be looking for or what university degree, because there was never anything else for me. And I had it very clear in my head what I would be doing with my life um, and that's not where I am now so it certainly was a veterinary degree uh, and it was certainly working in um, what, what was called mixed animal practice and I did do that for a number of years um, but again that sort of curiosity piece led me to um, do epidemiology postgraduate training and a bit like James indicated he doesn't feel like he's necessarily could call himself a physicist anymore I certainly couldn't call myself an epidemiologist but it was certainly piquing that curiosity and gave me uh, an incredible skill set and the confidence to look for opportunities outside of um, the standard veterinary, uh, clinical veterinary career. Uh, and somehow landed myself pretty quickly in the only um, high biocontainment laboratory in Australia. Um, so again, had to develop a whole sort of new skill set around laboratory science and understanding diagnostic testing, um, all this preclinical sort of um, you know model work and so on. So a whole new set of skill set. And I think, yeah, just picking up on that sort of of curiosity, peace, and wanting to continue to learn and apply that that real mix of skills. Um, to me, being able to integrate um, what we're seeing in the field, what we're seeing from an epidemiological perspective, and what we're seeing from the laboratory um, is absolutely essential to answering scientific questions rather than um, uh, having sort of a siloed approach. So um, I'm an um, kind of not not quite a jack of all trades and, uh, and and an expert in them, but you know I think bringing that broad range of skill sets is actually really important to um, answering uh, scientific challenges. Terrific. I'm wondering also uh, about some of your observations and reflections between all of you um, about how the work of today, the work of this year, fits in the sort of longer trajectory of history and the direct legacies that you're building upon in your work from the endeavours of uh, scientists and medical clinicians and others who've gone before, who've laid some of the foundations for the knowledge you're drawing on in direct application today. Look, I mean, I think science is very iterative and it's about teams. And, you know, one of the criticisms of like the no things like the Nobel Prize is that it, it makes people think that it's about that person. And it very rarely is, um, you know, we build upon, you know, years and years of work, um, you know, the, the back ground that, um, you know, James's um, mathematical models go back to Bob May and Roy Anderson. And then actually, even before that, there were, you know, a whole 
Kendrick and McCormick um, back uh, in the 20s, um, you know, just started describing some things and they've been refined and refined over time. So um, to end up where we are now. So, um, you know, there are big discoveries that are sometimes made in science, but actually most of it is sort of incremental changes and refining things and a new way of thinking about things or working with colleagues in another interdisciplinary area to um, to refine um, the tools that we have. So it's it's a, it's a much, I guess, less romantic uh, notion than someone jumping out of the bathtub with an idea. But uh, it, um, it it uh, it does happen. But it, it's building upon you know lots and lots of work that other people have done. That's a lovely invitation to invite you, James, to explain to our audience who who was the late uh, Lord May and uh, his Australian contribution to the world more largely. Yeah. So. Um... Bob May uh, was a physicist in, in Sydney, uh, I guess in the 50s. And, um, and, and then during the 60s and 70s, I guess, and I'm not a historian um, by any means, but um, he discovered an interest in ecology and realized or made a point in a, in a famous uh, paper in nat nature or science, I think it was in nature in the 70s, that systems that display very complicated behavior can be perhaps described by some very simple rules at times. And, and that doesn't mean that it's always the case. Sometimes complicated behavior has complicated explanations. But this was a revolutionary paper in ecology, and it naturally led him to get gather this interest um, in population dynamics, and then that naturally um, gets to infectious diseases. Um, it turns out he then spent most of his career um, at Oxford in the United Kingdom, um, and he very sadly died this year, not that long ago, actually. Um, but I sort of had this interesting link. So as an early physicist, um, one of his um, uh, sort of a, a colleague or a collaborator um, happens to be my PhD supervisor in physics. Um, and at the other end of Bob's career, um, one of Bob May's um, uh, supervisors, um, well, uh, sorry, one of Bob May's uh, students was the supervisor of Professor Jody McBurnan in Oxford, so through infectious diseases. So um, we sort of share a grandparent, I guess, in, um, in, 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 um, in academic terms, but it was Bob May once as a physicist and perhaps once as an ecologist or a population dynamics person. Actually, there's a there's a very interesting uh, concept. Is it the, in J James the Erdosh number, which is um, Paul Erdosh was a very famous mathematician, I think, from quite some time ago, but um, was very prolific and um, published um, co-authored papers with a lot of people. And the Erdosh number right. is how many people you are from Paul Erdosh himself. And actually, I think right. most mathematicians are sort of within four or five. I think I, my number's five. James would probably be two or something. But um, but it's I'm you know there are degrees. Of <laughs> there, there are sort of degrees of separation um, between all scientists, and um, that really just show, sort of shows how interlinked everything is. Mm. Absolutely, and a, a very big world, but a very small world in in others, right? And despite the sort of uh, distance and geography around the globe still, um, this incredible intertwining of expertise and knowledge. Paul, uh, just further from you, and there's a bit of noise in the background because we're here at Questacon and there's live interactive science going on, I love it. Paul, thinking about the history in your field as well, uh, are there other people whose work, uh, some of your team's work has directly built on, who you think about in the pursuit of what you do day to day, or perhaps just the field at large and how that sort of um, prior bullet body of knowledge is actually enabling you to do your piece of the work? Look, I, I think there probably wouldn't be too many people who would disagree with this. It, Professor Dan Murphy, um, Peter Doherty, um, who uh, <laughs> famously... Famous did, now. Uh, famously <laughs> Dan Murphy in opening time. But um, Pete, Peter leaves a great legacy. Peter is uh, a graduate of UQ, uh, but uh, is, is one of the world's leading experts in immunology, particularly of influenza, but uh, but has a broad interest in, in vaccines. And, and, you know, we we like to think that there is a, a lot of um, a lot of connect connectivity with uh, with Peter. The other one um, locally is Ian Fraser, of course, and uh, Ian Fraser, um, along with his colleagues, developed and I uh, totally agree with the concept that it's not one never one person. Um, Ian Fraser and his colleagues uh, developed the, um, the papillomavirus vaccine. And, and so UQ is, we're feeling rather 
while they're proud at the moment that we're following in that tradition, we haven't got to the end point of actually having a vaccine. I hope we will get there. Uh, but uh, I, I, I um, take a lot of uh, uh, advice and, uh, and uh, steering from, uh, from Ian and his uh, capable wisdom. Uh, Ian is also chair of the MRFF, so um, he has a big role to play in, in, uh, in the direction of uh, medical research in this country. So um, probably my two biggest uh, uh, heroes in, in, in this area. I, I mean, in, in terms of the uh, iterative, iterative process, I, I, we all, um, if, you, if you're going for promotion or if, you, if you're trying to uh, sell your own curriculum vitae, we, we scientists have a thing called an H-index. Uh, and uh, that, that is a measure of, uh, of the citations that are listed, you know, how many people cite your particular papers. And I make a, a point all the time here that my H-index is my group's H-index. And, and all of the people who've been in my lab um, um, ever since I began, because uh, really it is that collective effort where we iteratively walk on the, on the um, uh, work of, uh, of others just before us to, 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 to lead to where we are. Um, there are very rarely eureka moments of the, you know, jumping out of the bath with a novel idea. Mostly it's, it's iterative development, sometimes in leaps, but almost certainly it's come from a, an idea or a set of data that, that you have at your disposal. So that's a lovely um, way of unpacking the concept of patience in science as well, because sometimes in this busy, rushy world, we can all be, when, when we're getting a vaccine and uh, oh, yeah. you know, how, quickly, how quickly will we be turning the corner? I'm sure you've been asked that a few times and I know you can't actually answer that, right? Um, so let's, let's maybe uh, head towards the, the, the conclusion of this conversation with um, just thinking a little bit about unpacking the nature of patience and long-term commitment in science why we need to actually be in this for the long haul to unpack, um, to unlock cures and vaccines and, and, and um, solutions for some of the world's most complex challenges. I, I think maybe I could just quickly lead off and let the others, let others also uh, contribute to that because I'm sure we all have our own views, but um, it's about discovery. And uh, if you're not pushing the bounds of discovery, uh, then um, uh, you're not failing if you know what I mean. Uh, I mean failure is just a way of, of uh, teaching you a little bit more uh, to allow you to progress. It's the one thing that I uh, advise fresh honours students. So the, the students who are straight out of undergraduate um, training where, except where they're embedded in a laboratory where they're doing some work, mostly we, you're taught facts and, and you know, taught how to work together and so on, but it's all written down in textbooks and it seems fairly straightforward. The first thing you learn in an honours year where you're actually following your own project is things don't work quite often. And uh, you need to learn patience to, to develop through that. And also the, the, the knowledge that something that doesn't work can be much more informative than something that does work. Um, if things don't work, it's they don't work for a reason. Uh, there was a famous philosopher called Karl Popper who uh, wrote about conjectures and refutations. And, it's, and his, his thesis was you didn't set up experiments to prove something. You set up experiments to prove, prove them wrong. And if you couldn't prove it wrong, you were right. <laughs> and then if you actually think that through, that's a far more robust way of actually proving a hypothesis. Um, so patience is what you absolutely require to actually push those boundaries of, uh, of knowledge and, and really uh, be truly uh, discovering something new. I think the other point, you know, also brings us back to where we started the conversation around um, building on existing capability and existing networks. And, you know, we know that there's uh, a huge number of teams, scientific teams working internationally that, you know, essentially working 24 seven around things like um, vaccines and antivirals and so on. And there's recognition that it's that uh, incredible import and drive now as scientists internationally to be able to speed these things up. Uh, but behind all that is that existing capability. And even if we tried to speed the processes up now, uh, none of that would work if that um, existing capacity uh, and you know scientific expertise, if none of that was there to start with, all those collaborative networks. So um, those two in tandem are, are obviously um, really important and uh, yeah, absolutely integral to be able to, to solve these really challenging problems that we're dealing with. 
mean, I think one interesting point is that I guess we're sort of a lot of us are on the more applied side of um, science, um, but um, you know, there's basic science is really, really important. Mm -hmm. And you know, as an example, you know, cor cor coronavirus virology um, would have been you know a pretty esoteric branch of virology, and if I call it esoteric, it's really, really esoteric. Um, and retro retrovirology, um, you know, back in the uh, 80s was you know a really you know there were probably about two or three of them um and so that was again another really esoteric branch of um virology but um retrovirus you know if the fact that someone knew about retroviruses meant that when hiv came along they could be the mm -hmm. first to describe it and grow it and um and uh work out what was going on there and then same with coronaviruses you know before sars coronavirus um you know these were people that studied a virus that caused a common cold and no one was particularly interested in it but it turns out it's really important so you don't really know you know again i suppose it's like going back to my high school maths you never know what's really going to be useful in the future um and uh it's really important that we have um a lot of these sort of building blocks to um, base things on um, in the future because you never know where it's going to come from. And the same thing goes for the mathematics, of course. Um, you know, as in a very applied mathematician, I'm asked about um, what it's like to work in a department where lots of people aren't interested in applications. And I, my answer is that it's wonderful. I mean, the reason that I can do what I do is that there are mathematicians um, fascinated by the, you know, the internal grammar of the bit of mathematics that they're looking at or whatever it happens to be. And, you know, from that grows knowledge, you know, that's how we um, cultivate knowledge and develop understanding. And sometime, somewhere in the future, someone may, may or may not uh, use that theorem or that, that understanding to, to do something sort of in the immediate practical sense useful. Um, but it's all really sits there as an ecosystem of um, scientific discovery. Um, that enables always, people like us to do what we do. And perhaps not always linear or predictable about which of those yeah, pieces of right. work might end up. Yeah. There's a word, it's serendipity. And, yeah. and uh, right. you know, we, we build, there's a lot of emphasis, uh, particularly these days in, in terms of funding, for example, that everything that is gets funded needs to have a translational outcome. And, and you know, a greater truism is, is um, there is no greater truism than the fact that um, without basic science, you will have nothing to translate. Without those original discoveries, you would not be able to pick from that pool of information and translate out the uh, the, the, the key items. And that we could sit here here and list, uh, you know, a dozen or more different uh, major discoveries uh, that have led to major medical breakthroughs and, and treatments that came from a basic discovery out of basic research that didn't really have a translational outcome in mind. Mm. So I basic think... science, critical. <laughs> Basic science, not so basic, um, indeed. Just, just to finally uh, conclude our conversation, I feel like we could talk for, for a long time to come. If you're thinking about young people out there who might be watching this today and thinking seized by a desire to change the world with the course of the things they choose to study and invest their working lives in, what would you say about the value of science, technology, engineering and maths if, to someone, to a young person intent on making the world a better place? I think for me, I'd probably say if you're the sort of person who isn't quite sure what it is that you might do in the future, if you choose STEM, you can essentially write your own position description wherever you go. And that's a really rare thing to be able to actually walk into a role or a space where things are evolving all the time and there's a desire for things to change that if you decide you want to have a portfolio career and do you know be a physicist for a period of time or a vet for a period of time and then change and mold your career and your pathway um, to suit your interests and your passions or whatever it is that happens to be happening in the global or the local context you can do that with stem mm -hmm. and there's always there are always people wherever you go who will be prepared to support you in that um, and that's a really rare thing as a career to have one where you can really um, branch out or focus really narrowly in and be in a group of people who love to do that exact same thing with you. Yeah. Yeah. Be curious and be prepared to surprise yourself, I think. Mm. Yeah. And follow your passion. 
yeah, yeah. I think you, you sort of never know where you're going to end up. I think, you know, most people have more than one act in their mm -hmm. lives and uh, as it's in a sense, and, you know, I started out as a clinician and uh, sort of branched out in all sorts of different ways. And, you know, the maths that I learned at high school is still important. So um, I think being curious and sort of um, being able to, mm -hmm. You know, it is such a privilege to be able to, uh, you know, follow your own path in life and um, be useful, I guess. Yeah, absolutely. Can okay, I that, um, so for a Cheng index? I think <laughs> someone needs to come up with the Cheng index because, Alan, everybody knows you. <laughs> Cheng index in most people's life. <laughs> Excellent. All points lead back to Alan. I love it. <laughs> Terrific. Uh, thank you all so much for being a part of this discussion today for National Science Week. But more importantly, thank you also for the tireless work that each of you have been doing with your colleagues and teams across the country uh, to try to keep people safe, to save lives, to uh, pursue our quest for a vaccine. And thank you each of you uh, on behalf of all Australians for that work. Uh, to Dr Deb Eagles, uh, Professor Paul Young, Professor James McCaw, Professor Alan Cheng and Dr Kudzai Kanutu, thank you each of you for your work. Uh, we're going to go out now with a little reminder ahead of National Science Week that not all heroes wear capes and some of them come in lab coats and field technicians gear and all sorts of things. Uh, but the nation salutes you and your work and thanks you very sincerely for uh, your efforts over the course of 2020, but also over a lifetime as well. Thank you so much. What makes someone a hero? Superhuman powers? A flashy outfit? The thing is, not all heroes wear capes. Some wear lab coats, some wear suits, some wear scuba gear. Science produces a lot of heroes. National Science Week is a chance to honour those heroes and inspire new ones by getting involved in one of hundreds of online science events. Just Google National Science Week. No cape required.